Good evening, everyone. My name is Vikas. I'm the founder of T4. Um, I'm really pleased that you could join us here tonight um, for a one-off event for a one-off kind of guy. Um, you know, T4 was born at the time of the pandemic where there's a global community of teachers that came together to ask themselves and try to, uh, try to figure out what the new normal may mean for them. And so that's why, you know, when Ross said to me in terms of, you know, he's written this book, um, I was keen to make sure that we use our platform and everything that we are doing to help support him and his advocacy for great teacher practice and, and overall lifting the cause of the teacher. So friends, um, I, I'm pleased today to be able to launch this, uh, this book alongside with Ross and our speakers. And so, um, and so, but before I bring Ross on, I actually want to give some notices and see, see if everyone knows how to use the technology that exists today. So if you're watching this on Facebook, I want you all to make sure that I want to be able to put your comments on the screen. But in order for me to see your names on the screen, you're going to have to go to streamyard.com forward slash Facebook so that when you, when you put a comment in, we can actually see your name. This becomes important simply because we have, um, we have books to give away, free books. Uh, and we won't be able to know who's actually put up a comment unless you go to streamyard.com forward slash Facebook. Uh, friends, please don't forget to do that. So, um, and also I should tell you like, you know, Ross is such a uh, social media hit and has such a massive following that we it would, no event can really happen with Ross without a hashtag. And so the hashtag for tonight is hashtag Mark Plan Teach. So the hashtag for tonight is Mark Plan Teach. It becomes important simply because some of the books that Ross is going to give away today uh, is going to be a response uh, on Twitter. And so, you know, when we ask you to please make sure that you go and you use the hashtag so we can track everything that is happening. Uh, I thank you for that. And it goes without saying, before I introduce Ross, uh, you should go and buy Mark Plan and Teach. And if you go to bloomsbury.com, you will get a 25% discount. Uh, if you put this MPT 2021 code in, in the field that uh, when you buy the book. So uh, here are three notices that I've provided. The first being, you know, make sure that you give StreamYard permission for us to see your name. The second being, uh, make sure you use this hashtag for tonight. And the third thing is, go buy the book. Uh, that's the whole purpose of doing this event. And we want you to make sure that you get a discount, which is only right. You get 25% off when you use MPT 2021. Friends, uh, I'm delighted to bring uh, our key speaker, our uh, our chief guest, and the person in the spotlight. Uh, Ross, welcome to uh, welcome to your own book launch. Uh, welcome yeah. to this live stream. Hi, thank you, Vikas. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining me. Um, virtual book launch. Um, I'm delighted that you can join me and um, for people watching maybe retrospectively, I hope this uh, little kind of session gives you some food for thoughts, new ideas and a sense of reassurance during a very challenging time for us all, particularly uh, teachers working in the education sector. Um, so I'm super excited. Uh, thank you, Vikas, for hosting. Um, I've got lots of nice special guests for you this evening. So, so Ross, um, you know, Ross told me that there's over a thousand people who have registered for this event which is just fantastic, from over 42 countries, uh, which is incredible when you think about it and what technology allows us to do. We were, we were talking earlier that this is Ross's eighth book, and whenever he's organized a book launch event, normally you get 50, 60, maybe 100 people, but technology now allows us all from around the world to take part. And so what I want to do is actually ask you for maybe two minutes. Uh, tell me in the comments where you're from. So this is an example where, uh, which I'm trying to avoid. So that's why you need to go to streamyard.com forward slash uh, Facebook and give permission so that we can see your name. But here is an example of someone telling us where they're from. And I can't tell you who it is apart from that is from Lebanon. Lebanon. Or, or this person is from Dublin. Um, and, so, and so I want to make sure now there's, a, there's a, Douglas Sinclair wins the prize. You know, he tells us he's from Scotland. So he's actually allowed StreamYard permission, and that's why we can see his name here. Which, so I part, wonder, which part? Which part of Scotland, Douglas? Please put, put your comments up. 
And so we have uh, we have London. So someone watching on YouTube, Danza is saying London. This person is saying Anglesey, but I don't know who you are. This person is saying Bradford. Now that's not too far from you, uh, Ross. Yeah. Mel Reed is saying Bournemouth, which is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, uh, some Maureen from Belfast, and she's watching on LinkedIn. Ruth is saying, well, this is really moving along. My, my browser can't even keep up. Check this out. <laughs> Michael Wardrop is hey, Michael. That is incredible. So well done, Ross. You've got all these people yeah. uh, lined up to listen to you. Uh, yeah. And this is great interaction. Now, well, I better be good, eh? I better make sure I say something worthwhile. <laughs> no, 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 pre no pressure, I see. Uh, and, so, and so here you are, Felix from Switzerland, which is just incredible as well. So you do have a global audience and a global, you know, as much as, uh, you know, Mrs. Uh, uh, Morrison McGill laments and you talk about, honey, I really am world famous. You are world famous, Ross. You can, you can show this to her. Uh, and so this well, is amazing. She brings me soon, uh, soon down to earth, that's for sure. <laughs> All right. So, so then uh, we want to get on with this event. And, um, you know, I'm really delighted that today we have, uh, we have some friends who are incredible at what they do, who are going to be speaking to us as well. And we've invited them on because they're just, they're not just friends of ours, but they're prolific teachers and school leaders. So before I, I introduce them, you know, I want to tell you a little bit about them. So we have two friends. Uh, one is uh, Vijita Patel, who is the principal of the Swiss Cottage School uh, Development Research Center, which is a special needs school for children aged 2 to 19 in the London Borough of Camden. Uh, the school is a designated national teaching school, leading an alliance of schools, organizations, and higher education partners to provide teacher training and support school improvement priorities across the region and country. Uh, Vijita herself is a national leader of education who supports head teachers, senior and middle leaders, SENCOs, and local authority teams on leading locality and provision developments as the complexity of need increases with this new generation of children with SEM. You know, she's con contributed to the development of programs for teacher training and leadership development, and also worked with postgrad students on personalized learning through research on cognitive processing. The second person we have is another friend of mine uh, and someone I've known for a few years because she's won this most incredible global teacher prize in 2018. That is Andrea Zafiriku. Uh, she's a teacher at Alperton Community School in Brent. Uh, she won the $1 million prize uh, when she was crowned the best teacher in the world. Uh, she's an art and textile teachers in, a teacher in Brent, which is on the outskirts of London, uh, and which is one of the world's most ethnically diverse places. She's passionate about education and changing the lives of young people and underserved communities through creativity. You know, using the prize money awarded by the Global Teacher Prize, Andrea founded a charity called Artists in Residence, which I'm a trustee of, which has the aim to improve arts education in London. Uh, she has many accolades to her name. And so I'm really pleased that Andrea and Vijita have joined us here today. And I want to, uh, what is that word? Mark Brown Peach. <laughs> so what I wanted to do was, uh, ladies, welcome, welcome to this um, book launch. Uh, it's really great seeing you as always. Um, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to use the opportunity to ask you some questions, if it's okay. And Rob, I'll come back to you soon, so I'm going to take you off the screen for now. And so, Andrea and Vijita. So, Vijita, you know, the questions I I wanted to ask are, you know, you are in a very challenging context in terms of special needs. You know, what's the climate currently in your school? Such a good question. And I think it's really important for us to hold up the reality that um, every climate is influenced by the community stakeholders. So if we think about our pupils, their families, um, our staff, the multiple professionals that wrap around our school provision, our governors, many of our partners, What's really important for us is that we have always remained committed to ensuring we're developing a meaningful relationship and that there's authenticity in each of those relationships. And that is what has allowed us as a community to develop our climate together. Because these are such surreal times, it's incredibly important that we have the strength as a community to be able to have a responsive and resilient climate. The energy of our teachers and practitioners in being able to focus on how they wanna design and continually commit to personalized learning, whether they're in person or in the virtual school, 
remains incredibly inspiring to me. And that I think is what is at the heart of our positive climate in these very sort of complex times. So Vegeta, that's a really great answer you provide and it, it gives us um, a lot of confidence in what's happening. But you know, given the times that we're in, um, you know, what, what are the things that are happening different in your school? You know, how are your teachers dealing with this differently to where, what, what used to be the norm? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Hmm. Um, it's really interesting because I think what's important with that is, again, um, that sense of what we've committed to as a school for our learning culture. Um, and we've got a culture that respects the expertise of our teachers and practitioners as leaders of le learning design. So when I think about what they're doing differently, actually what's really exciting to me is what continues. They're not seeking permission to think about that reflective journey. We haven't stopped our commitment to inquiry-based reflective practice. And books like Mark Plan Teach and the generosity that Ross has provided on his websites to share his materials continue to scaffold the reflective journey and collaborations across our networks of teachers. So in many ways, although the circumstances around us are quite profound and they do introduce this change on what education is, especially in that blended learning um, sort of scenario, what I think is fantastic is that we as a school are not waiting for criteria. We're not waiting for someone to tell us what does good teaching look like in remote education. The materials that we have from colleagues like Ross are supporting our teachers to work together to try to co-define that. And their relationships with parents allows them to work with parents to be able to co-define that as well. So I think what's really important is actually um, that all school leaders are taking this opportunity, if that hasn't happened so far, to make sure that that empowerment of teachers and their reflective practice is introduced because schools are being redefined. And so, um it's really, you know, thank you for that. And you're right to say that we're going through this almost paradigm shift and we're at this mm -hmm. inflection point. Mm -hmm. You know, the question that comes up time and time again is your students have various learning difficulties and in the special education needs category. You know, how, how have this, the students and how are their families adopted to this new context? I'd be curious mm -hmm. to know your response to that. Such an important question. And, you know, it can be a population that can be highly marginalized. I think what's exciting for us is that because the relationships are so strong, our students are teaching us what we need to start to redesign within our curriculum. The society is changing around all of us. And what we don't want to do is compound that marginalization. So we know that now more than ever, wrapping well-being and all those aspects with social and emotional aspects of learning is quite crucial so that we continue to develop their role in society, but in a way that actually is going to make sure that they are there as society is actually redefining itself. And that although they may not, may not be a large voice because they can be a smaller population, there's this understanding on being able to think about those pupils as equally important in those considerations on the role of children and young people as society is going through these shifts as well. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Uh, Vijita and every, everyone who's watching, you know, if you have a question for any of our speakers, please do ask it in the comments and I will come to it and I will make sure that I get as many in after I, I ask a set of questions to Andrea. Uh, Andrea, you know, welcome to this. And I know, I know that you've just come from a year eight parents evening. Uh, what questions are they asking? I wanna know. Uh, you, you see when, when you joined this live stream, uh, like every teacher, you were, you were, you were energized, I found. Um, but I'd love to hear from you, what is it that you're be saying? I'm pumped. I'm pumped. Um, no, it's been quite, it's, do you know what? It's amazing. Um, I have never heard the word thank you so much. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Um, we, we know how difficult it's been. I mean, I, I, uh, the, the most embarrassing is, is they say, oh, and we really like your laugh when you teach. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's the fact that they can hear us. So the parents are, are also our audience in the classroom. But it's been really wonderful just speaking to the parents and seeing how things are at home and and to give them the reassurance. They want to know that their child is making progress, that there's no gaps. They haven't lost anything. 
Um, and I think that's that's you know that that's the biggest challenge that teachers are having, just to make sure that we just try and do what we can to stay on that road or back on track. And so um, I I will finish my set of questions, but there's a uh, Harriet Randall is asking this question. Sorry, it's slightly off topic. What advice would you give to a primary year five teacher returning from maternity leave in in these crazy times? Andrea, I'm going to come to you for that. Oh gosh, Harriet, I'd say just be kind to yourself and just enjoy the ride and um, ask questions and do not worry. Um, I, so. The biggest transforming shift I've noticed in my teaching and everyone's teaching is that even I've been teaching for quite a few many years, I've had to just leave that behind. I've started again. I've started to learn new techniques, new skills. I've really reflected on my pedagogy and it's just been so excited um, to feel refreshed and get back to being a really exciting, energized, enthused teacher. Um, and I'm not just saying this, but where do you go to? Where do you go to when you want to just try and refresh your pedagogy and just find out, you know, how do I do this? You go to Mark Van's Teach, you go to Teach Toolkit, um, the books which you've got on your bookshelves, and you take them out as teachers and you flip through and you're like, Oh, do you know what? I'm going to do that. So, um, Harriet, do not panic. There's people around you who are there to support you. The teacher world's gone mad in terms of sharing amazing, amazing resources. The amount of love and sharing good practice that we have, we are giving to each other is just, I mean, there's no other profession like it. No other profession. So um, thank you to everyone. But Harriet, we've got you. Don't worry. And Vijita, you know, Christopher Baptiste asked this question, which is how can we best support our learners with autism spectrum disorder through remote learning? Do you want to give a view on that? Absolutely. And uh, holding on to the fact that every pupil with um, autistic spectrum disorders is an individual. Um, what's really important is, again, I think echoing what Andrea has said, us bringing it back to basics, thinking about what we can support families to do to reduce the um, sort of uh, busy atmosphere that can be in the home environment so that the child or young person is able to have uh, an area that is going to support them as they engage in that learning and then giving the parents four to five scaffolds so that they know how to engage and motivate that child into that point of learning. I think it's really important um, any country that you're in to get in touch with teachers that are working with pupils with special educational needs because there's no reason that you need to reinvent the wheel or try to learn the new skills. The sharing of best practice is going to be incredibly useful so that you're able to put in a phase one, reflect, and then think about phase two. I would say make sure the pupils and the parents are involved in that reflection so that they can tell you what they're finding successful and what they have as um, sort of curious questions that helps you shape the next approach to that remote education. And so thank you so much for that, uh, Vijita. I often do say that the best special needs leader in the UK, uh, and that's Vijita Patel from Swiss Cottage. So, uh, so thank you for that. Andrea, I want to come back to you on this. And I know that this is a really big part of uh, what you do in your role at the school. Uh, how do you keep your teachers motivated in these times? I think the biggest thing you can do is just to empathize to connect with them and just to say look just carry on going and whatever you need we're there so um what i'm seeing from many of my colleagues is that you know i've never known anyone or any profession but my teachers are working above and beyond they they are just so dedicated they want to make this absolutely right they, they're feeling guilty in terms of having to learn something and deliver it in a different way so the way to keep them motivated is just making sure that we we cut out all the unnecessary things, meetings, um, give lots of time to plan, uh, making sure that we create uh, opportunities for them to connect with each other, so virtual staff rooms, picking up the phone, senior leaders, and calling your teams and saying, you know, how are you? How are you coping with the kids? You know, just that one-to-one -one connection. Oh, my God, that goes so, so far. So I think it's remembering that, yes, we've got such an important job to deliver and to create um, an incredible learning opportunity for our young people. But we've also got to look after our teachers as well, because if they're not looked after, they can't do what they do best. Thank you both for, for taking part. I want to bring Ross back to the stream now. Uh, Ross, um, you know, I have a set of questions for you, but I want the I want Andrea and Vijita to stay for these questions because they may be able to add some perspective as well, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, the question that I, I have for you, and I have, I have the books over here. 
Um, you know, and I, 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 actually, have, I have the books as well. Um, <laughs> and, and so what I want to know what happen tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I actually called Ross up yesterday. I said, Ross, these are actually really good. Um, so, so well done. But no, like, you know, I think we should give a book away, Ross. And so, yeah, why not? And so let, let's do this. I, I mean, we were thinking of a, a mechanic to you to see who should get a book. But if you can guess the answer uh, to answer this question right, um, we I suppose we will we will give a give away a, a book to that person. Whoever yeah, writes and and appears appears on this oh, feed. They're, right? back. Look, they're all ready to go. <laughs> we put the sticky labels on. They're all ready. I'm going to put them in the post tomorrow. Fantastic. And so what I wanted to ask, the, the question I want to ask is, how many letters are there in Teacher Toolkit? Ooh. Have you worked that out before you asked the question? I'm <laughs> counting as we speak. <laughs> are we 20, 25. 25. <laughs> uh, any, 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 and no one's, asking, no one's answering that question. They're all stumped. How many letters are there in Teacher Toolkit? If you answer that, you get the book. Right, you're gonna have to winner there. I I'm gonna uh, come on, Michael from Australia. I come on, Matt you can Pearson, do this. Matt Pearson <laughs> was first there. I, I think I think Michael from Australia should get a book. Yeah, I all right, so. Michael. Uh, he's having his I breakfast have a very morning. steep hill tomorrow morning and post it to Australia <laughs> to you. Fantastic. So Ross, I wanted to ask you in terms of like you know, this is version two of your book. How does how does this differ from version one? I'll answer that question, but just to help Michael, he needs to email me if he wants that book. So he needs to email me at support at teacheroftoolkit.co.uk. Otherwise, he's not going to get it. <laughs> the thing is, it's too early for maths, but Michael, if you want a book, you better write to Ross. Yeah, right. So um, the answer to the question, um, you know, the first book, I've got some slides to show people a little bit later, but um, the first book was constructed in my own school as a deputy head with 110 teachers, not in a school not too far away from where Vegeta is. Mm -hmm. You know, Vegeta will know the school very well and the context and the challenge that it has. And particularly when I was there, it was going through quite a difficult time. Uh, but there was kind of nothing in terms of parity teaching and learning uh, for the teachers that were there. So we built um, our own teaching and learning policy. And um, it followed a Mark plan teaching methodology. The reason Mark uh, is first is because that's the, the assessment that underpins your kind of planning approach, your curriculum decisions. Um, so we met every week on our, our, our kind of our group basis, whole school, that type of stuff. We built Mark Plan Teach as a, a policy, and then I turned it into a book. And um, the school went through quite a difficult challenge. So the first edition has lots of that raw emotion in it, which I probably think makes it quite a good book. Um, but the last three years, I've lived the book in, you know, thousands of thousands of what well, I was with thousands of schools, hundreds of schools with tens of thousands of teachers and I've learned to see what works in lots of different contexts from schools like Vegeta's special needs context, virtual schools, Peru's, um, international contexts. Um, mm. And it's allowed me to understand what ideas work. So in a remote context, I'll be able to maybe give a few ideas there later. But um, so the, the version two is an update in terms of what I've seen and refining and updating much of the content. So, you know, I proofread the whole book twice at the start of lockdown, and then I rewrote it. And then I kept all the bits that I particularly thought were important and you know, doing a lot of kind of neuroscience and memory recently. So I've written a lot about that in there. And just a kind of wider lens in terms of what I've seen internationally. So I do think it's, you know, without kind of using biblical terms, it's a book that people can use uh, all the time. I think it will be a timeless uh, book. Um, and uh, the great thing with the second version, as people will know, is there's this visual guide. And, and this kind of stems from the... You know, 14 million teachers that have read my website. You know, most people are just downloaded resources, but where there are a blog, to, where there's a blog read, and um, that analytical data, which I've been looking at for 10 years now, um, the average reading time is a minute and a half. So it confirms to me that teachers are very busy people. They need practical mm -hmm. ideas. Search and theory is already kind of uh, unpicked. Here's how to plug and play into your classroom the next day. And um, so that visual guide is kind of supporting that one minute read. And if there's something that someone likes, they can explore the book. And go into it in greater depth so yeah that's the difference between one and two 
Ross, I suppose I, I, we should also try to answer this question, which is, you know, what are the key takeaways for teachers, given the context that we've been living for the last year uh, from this book? Um, well, I, I think, you know, from a COVID perspective, you know, I don't want to go through all the whole thing, but, you know, I think teachers have got um, a, a greater kind of uh, place in society. Um, you know, the challenges of all the parents going through homeschool or teachers having to homeschool as well as teach. Um, and a lot of the kind of myths and perceptions, you know, you see a lot of celebrity teachers on, you, you know, you know, not to kind of break the work that they do. But it's not. It's not teaching. You know, teachers are qualified individuals who understand uh, how learning happens, um, how to unlock children's potentials, how to make a grade A feel a pretty, a pretty poor attempt, or how to make a grade E feel amazing. Um, so we've kind of mastered this. We, we go to university to learn our craft, uh, and then we spend years trying to refine it, and we never, we're never quite happy with uh, what we do. So, uh, uh, you know, that's a practical sense. But, you know, through COVID, you know, all kind of remote learning, the remote teaching, the homeschooling kind of dialogue. Um, there are many things that we can translate onto an online environment. I guess it's a, the, the challenge is learning the technology. And then you've got a huge number of kind of safeguarding issues to consider as well. Um, but pretty much good teaching applies in all contexts. You know, and I, I've been doing webinars for 10 years, so I adapted quite quickly to this online world. But um, it's been great to see the profession respond. Um, you know, and, and see a lot of people sharing uh, loads of ideas. Um, you know, the teaching profession itself know the answers already, just echoing what Vegeta said earlier. Um, we know the answers. Um, we don't need the government to essentially kind of signpost, um, you, know, it, you know, obviously we can do with more time and funding, those types of things. But um, I'm talking here from an English perspective. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but I, I think we are pretty much in a better place. Um, whether we kind of operates uh, well in this environment, um, you know, post-pandemic uh, and how schools will evolve uh, is another discussion, I suppose. But um, it's an interesting one. So I will, th thanks a lot for that, Ross. So I think it's time to go give away a second book. And the question that I have for each and every single one of you, uh, and I see that the last one caused a lot of frustration uh, in, in, in trying to digest how many letters there were uh, in, in the book. <laughs> But what is the hashtag for this event? Uh, please go to social media sites and use the hashtag. Easy. And when you when you put the hashtag after that, put your name, and then we'll select uh, we'll select a winner from that. Let's see. Let's see. We're doing that one on social media. Okay. Yeah. So if you go under any of these platforms, do a hashtag and tell us. Because, uh, yeah, um, we've had actually a really brilliant question from Francesca Jackson, and she asked Ross, is this book good enough for NQ, or is this book suitable for NQTs? Well, it, it is, but I've always believed that, you know, when you become very experienced, you try to unpick complex ideas to help other teachers, and I'm really passionately believe that, you know, teaching is a team sport, and experienced teachers must share the wisdom the challenge for all of us whether you're a new teacher or an experienced teacher is if i read your book or someone else's blog i have to translate that back into my own classroom with my kids and with my school policy and that's something that you have to learn through your own experiences uh, as you acquire more wisdom so there are things you can take away and are pretty self-explanatory but kind of getting into the depth where it becomes part of your uh, kind of professional wisdom um, where it becomes uh, not automated, but part of your teacher DNA, um, where you can you know, run things on your feet and hold kids to account and manage and inspire 30 kids right in front of you. Those things you will learn throughout your career. So so the answer is yes. <laughs> Andrew, Andrew, you can't ask anymore. Can't no, ask no, anymore. I, have to, I have to, because um, actually, Francesca, he's far too humble. The word is yes, it's going to be brilliant. And also, also put in your shopping basket, the teacher toolkit uh, book, which is incredible. Really, really great for um, for NQTs. So yeah, that, uh, you should go, Francesca, you need to go buy the book. But the winner <laughs> of our second book, the winner <laughs> of our second book, ladies and gentlemen, is... Daniel Bull. Daniel Bull was the first person on my timeline. So Daniel, okay. and so da Daniel, you need to email Ross, and he will send you uh, a, a book. Now, send me email. And, and, and so, Ross, the qu the question that really comes up time and time again, and I'm hoping that you'll be able to answer, 
is this? You know, uh, this is the conundrum of the time. You know, how do you keep kids learning online? What are the best ways to engage them? Well, I guess the answer that I'm going to come to straight, you know, our cognitive ability. So most adults can have a deep focus for about 20 minutes. So we're now on this webinar for 30 minutes. We probably need a glass of water and stretch our legs, everyone. Um, but when we, you know, a broad rule of thumb for children, you know, obviously I can't talk for every child in the world, but if you take a child's age plus two, that's generally the kind of cognitive load before they start to uh, get distracted or daydream. So in an online environment where, you know, if I turn my camera off and you can't see me anymore and you're only listening to my voice, um, I'm not supporting cognitive load through visual cues or through mm -hmm. hand signals or, or pausing to give you time to digest what I've said. So all these things translate in an online environment as well as physical. I think, you know, I wish I'd learned more about memory as a new teacher. In fact, I wish it was part of my teacher training course. But I do think it's the number one thing that teachers need to know. Uh, later, I'm going to share it with everyone watching. Um, and I do think it will make you a better teacher. And I think more, more importantly, when parents and pupils have a better understanding of how they learn, I think it's not only a social justice issue, but it will also deal with a lot of workload challenges that teachers face. Um, we mm. often see that we have to teach new material all the time, but you know, through learning lost and recovery curriculum through the pandemic, we need to reinforce content that's already been taught before to help that long-term retention. So there's a huge myth out there that we always need to learn new material and get through the curriculum. Well, we, well, no, we don't. What we need to do is the eight, six months that we've lost in the curriculum, we need to reinforce what was taught before. Mm -hmm. Again, whatever your curriculum you have on your documents, it's not going to translate the same way through through remote. So my 60-minute lesson physically with kids could be totally different to a, a virtual session where the technology might fail. Um, so, um, yeah, kind of 10, 15-minute chunks is your best bet for secondary kids for adults, we're looking at 20, 25 minutes before we all start to get bored of what Ross is say, saying. Uh, and then for younger kids, you know, there'll be other specialists out there with early years, but, you know, shorter times. And, and mix it up. M mix up the strategies. Thank you. And if you, if you enjoyed hearing Ross's comments on that particular question, I, I want to tell you a little bit about something that I'm hosting on the 17th of April, which is called the Teacher Tech Summit. And the purpose of it is quite simply to help teachers uh, grapple with these questions that we have with the use of technology through their teaching. So we'll be answering those kinds of questions such as, you know, how do I <laughs> content? You know, how do I engage kids in online classrooms? You know, how do I assess online? How do I teach in a hybrid environment? And so if you're keen to actually learn from other teachers who do this very well, it's very much a show and tell effort where teachers who use Technology exceptionally will be coming and showing you tips and tricks as to how they actually perform their roles given this new era that we're in, then please go to t4.education and, and, and register for the Teacher Tech Summit on the 17th of April. There's a Teacher Tech Summit, 17th of April, and as we are revealing our first speaker here tonight, and that is our very own Ross. So uh, you will get to hear a lot more about this. Uh, and I hope you will register for that event. I mean, a thousand odd delegates have already registered from around the world, and we think it'll be a stunning turnout, but we'll learn a lot from around the world. So please go to t4.education and do that. Now, Andrea and Vijita, uh, I, you know, no book launch should ever go without praise for their author. Um, you know, you, you actually, Vijita, you're the person that introduced me to Ross. Uh, tell me, when you think about Ross and what he does, what comes to your mind? <laughs> I have to say that I was such a generosity in sharing his own learning journey and what he's done, not just in his approach for learning design, what he's then done for groups of teachers, but what he's considered that in terms of children and young people in a community that need education to move beyond what is seen as their uh, predestined outcomes. And um, I have to say for anybody that's uh, joining us today, please check the website. Um, you know, if there's financial circumstances and you can't access this book, Ross is so generous at putting so much of his material onto the website. He gives blogs that actually let us as teachers and educators step into his experiences and it gives us a reflective partner. I can sometimes 
uh, recall the way that we've worked with trainee teachers and NQTs, and we've helped them think about how their mentors are interacting with Ross's materials to support them. So uh, for me, certainly generosity of expertise and also an engagement in considering the newest research that's there in education, which is reflected in his integration of the neuroscience for learning with this construct of how to design teaching and learning as well. You won yourself a book, Vijita, that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Andrea, Andrea, over to you. Uh, what can I say about, what can I say about, he's the godfather. He's the godfather <laughs> of the teachers. I mean, five minute lesson plan, that got me through my life as a teacher. I won the Global Teacher Prize because of Ross and his teaching techniques. <laughs> um, no, he's, he's somebody who gets us, I think. And um, for me personally, he comes from a creative subject so design technology is his is his specialism uh and for an art teacher i think yeah i get i he understands and that's really important um and yeah he's our godfather he's the teacher godfather <laughs> got his his turn the same trade as his polo shirt which is great yeah. to see um so what i want to do is i want to take that a little bit further uh and i actually ask you in your comments and i i'm going to ask andrea to select the winner why is it that you've tuned in today and what has Ross done to support you in your teaching and the way you operate? So put up a comment and we'll pick one uh, and uh, Andrew will select the winner. Uh, Ross, hey. there's, a, there's a question that's come. Uh, so yes. in the meantime, in the meantime, whilst people are busy writing their notes to win a prize as to why you're so great, um, you know, if there's, there's a user and I can't see their name, says if you could recommend uh, uh, you know, a particular page in your book or a chapter, which would it be and why? Um, well, that's, um, well, can I have two answers? Um, the first one is, well, in fact, I'm going to have three. <laughs> uh, I think page 135, which is the chapter on memory, which I've already talked about. Then there is the final chapter of the book, which is coaching. Um, we've got a lot of misconceptions about coaching or a bit cynical, but it's the number one thing that unlocks all teacher potential. It doesn't matter how long you've been in the teacher profession. And the challenge for school leaders is to try and get the logistics working structurally so that coaching cultures can thrive rather than just be a tick box exercise. I guess the key chapter that I've learned the greatest last three years, I, I, part of my kind of seminars at the University of Cambridge, we watched some lesson observations as researchers and it totally blew my mind. So it's something I share with all school leaders I work with. It will totally change and transform the way that you ever watch a lesson observation again. So that's chapter eight in the teach section of the book. And I, I explain the entire methodology. And I've got a whole set of slides and webinars on my slide where I walk through the whole experience with you. And the example I give, you can use it in any context uh, with your own teachers is what I would recommend with your own kids in your school. And you'll never, you'll never go into an observation again with a tip list or any focus. Um, so those three chapters, uh, the memory chapter, the observation chapter, and the coaching chapter, all in the last part of the book. So we have some great comments. I want, uh, uh, Ross, just sit back and I want you to watch some of this because I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> you know, if I had this happening, I, you know, I'd be on cloud nine. Uh, and so we have... We, we have Michael Evans who says, love the five minute uh, lesson plan, I think it should read. Uh, Gil or Jill has said, the five minute lesson plan is a brilliant concept and I've always used this. You know, uh, Daniel Lewis talks about, again, the five minute lesson plan. Um, Br my friend Branka says, what a positive atmosphere tonight. Um, yeah, you know, which is great. <laughs> you know, in today's age, we do need positivity. Um, uh, obviously, Sinead says, Mark Plan Teach is her best. Um, you know, uh, then hey, check this out. Amy says the five minute lesson plan got me my current job, um, which is fantastic. You know, Matthew really? said, Ross has inspired me to be a better teacher. Ah. And enabled me to have a work with Why are you watching this now, not on the sofa? I hope you are on the sofa then at least. <laughs> Danza, Danza, Ross has inspired me to always put my best foot forward in teaching. He inspires me to learn more and build my pedagogy awareness. There's oh, Jordan, uh, Louise Hussein, you know, five minute lesson plan, save me two during NQT year, came to get some perspective, so easy to get stuck mm. in your little bubble and lose sight while you're doing this. Um, 
you know, and on and and on it goes. Love his common sense approach and passion to support the profession. Gemma lives to tell the tale and says, Ross lectured me on my PGCE at Buckingham University last year. Thank you. Um, Dawn Peel says, I'm new to teaching, and this year has been a minefield. Ross's wow. method of relief uh, in these times. Um, someone can I says, say can, I just, can I interrupt you, Vicar? Can I just say thank you to everybody? Because when you work on your own, you know, I've been self employed the last three years, and, you know, lockdown, even particularly, you know, I'm not a kid that mental health for me has been easy, but to get all these all this feedback makes a big difference. And, and when you've got a huge following like I have on social media, it's not always positive, and you do get a lot of critique, and sometimes it puts you back into your shell. But all these comments tonight, genuinely, I, I'm you know welling up a little bit. It really does make a difference to get that feedback, and um, because otherwise I'm I'm on my own, and, and and unless I'm in schools with you, bringing it all to life and and having that conversations with you. And obviously I'm doing that remotely, but it's not quite, we know it's not quite the same as face-to-face. -face. Um, mm -hmm. It really makes a big difference, so thank you. Ross, listen, all said and done, this comment that I flashed up is what you're talking about. <laughs> my, my, wife is, my wife is watching this, so I have my wife is uh, the most beautiful lady in my world. So I'm not so, really going to that one. So Debbie, uh, please write in to Ross. And Andrea will give you her book. Yeah. I actually, actually, is it? Can I now choose? I've got, I've got the winner. Is that, is okay, that's no, okay. We, out of the five books that I'm giving away, Debbie is one of them. So Debbie, please write in. Andrea, go for it. Right. So actually, I've got two. So Ross, no, no, you got one, one, one. No, no. Come on, Ross. Come on, Ross. Look at the love. I've got thirty books in the back, so I've got plenty okay, books. Okay. Look, look at the love. Look at the love, Vikas. He can. He can. We can get another book. So number one, Debbie, love it. You're getting one. Just that comment alone about him and his good looks. Brilliant. Love it. You're having one. And also, um, King. Where's King? Just your name, King. King Jakub. You 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 mentioned something there. Um. So you are the winners. So Debbie and King. Um, and um, I think it was Dawn who mentioned, I'm not, but, but Dawn, um, we know how difficult for an NQT um, uh, uh, initial teacher training, all of you guys, we know how difficult this year has been for you. Um, so just thank you for carrying on, keep going, keep going, and we'll soon get out of this. Well, listen, so we should, we should actually, you know, this is supposed to be a CPD session, by the way. Uh, we've been going on and on. Ross, what kind of guy are you, man? You're just taking all these credits and not giving anything back. Um, so, ladies, thank you so much for participating in today's book launch. Uh, I, too, am going to take myself off the screen, and we're going to hand over to uh, to Ross, who is going to yeah. who is going to conduct a a a, a session uh, for the next 20, 25 minutes. And then we've got one final guest who will be joining us, which means that we will overrun. Uh, by five ten minutes, but it's a very very yeah, special. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing. Wrong with that. And so and so, we hope you can hang on. Uh, but Ross, over to you, and thank you so much, Vijita. So thank you so much, Andrea. Okay, right. So let, let's let's uh, control my screen uh, and see what I'm gonna just move things around. So you might get a little bit of a, a duplicate screen here. Um, so you should see my screen. Uh, can you confirm that, everybody in the chat box? Um, so first thing I want to signpost, this little web link here, um, if you go to teachertoolkit.co.uk forward slash thank you with a hyphen between thank and you, um, you've got all the links obviously here, but what I would just like to explain to you uh, underneath is you've got uh, my newsletter, so I, I know some of you already received this, but I, I email um, teachers loads of stuff behind the scenes that you don't see on social media so i've got about forty-five thousand of you there so thank you for that but here are all the goodies so i've given you a few kind of links here to have a look through there's all the slides that we're about to go through i'm going to try and do this in 15 20 minutes and loads of resources again behind the scenes and there's a little discount code here um so i'll just zoom that up in case someone can grab it and put it in the commentary box um and you can get code and download stuff etc but it's all there for you a couple of little videos um, so just thought I'd share this first um, and uh, hopefully you can use those to your um, advantage. Um, so I just want to take a moment to go through um, the kind of key philosophy between the book, uh, what's changed, the kind of journey, and just I've picked out some of the core ideas from the new book. And I've got my visualizer here um, where I'm going to hopefully switch cameras and take you through the actual visual guide. 
Um, so whether I do this in 15 minutes will be interesting. So very quickly, um, the original book and this new book is still about stripping back a lot of the nonsense in the teaching profession, particularly in countries where there's high accountability. Uh, I'm picking the complex nature of the classroom to help teachers prioritize where they should put their best efforts. And it's all underpinned by research, all my own pragmatic experience. These aren't my ideas, it's they're the profession's ideas. Um, where I've unpicked, learned, tweaked, and shared it back. Um, the original premise of Mark Plan Teach One was the teachers on the ground in my last school, where we developed it together. It very much is a profession book. Um, and, you know, stripping back, going back to teachers' core focus, Mark Plan Teach uh, to improve our well being, and as a result, will improve um, teacher uh, pupil outcomes. So the journey, in a nutshell, um, you know, I've been leading whole school teaching and learning, I think three or four secondary schools in London now, um, dating back to uh, a long time ago um, when I started kind of my first senior leadership position. Um, I started blogging in 2000, but actually a teacher blogging in 2008. So if you dig deep on the website, you'll find lots of uh, very embarrassing things on there, but lots of interesting uh, reflections uh, as well. My, my journey was literally... To, to write what I was doing and one person replied and today now 300,000 visitors a month which is crazy. Mark Plantich started in this school in Westminster uh, where I was appointed deputy head teacher in charge of teacher CPD and teaching and learning. 110 teachers, 150 support staff so it was no mean feat to look after the CPD needs of 250 adults. Um, the first thing we did was got rid of lesson gradients, we introduced a weekly CPD, we sent our kids home on a Wednesday afternoon and in, in groups, all staff, individuals, external and internal events. We talked about teaching and learning on a weekly basis. And if I think back to what I've learned and seen on my travels over the last three years, the happier schools do this. They protect it fiercely to allow teachers to come together to learn from one another. And I think this is the key message I want to give to you all. Find a school that gives you the, the kind of soil in which to grow professionally as a teacher. Uh, you know, in Britain alone, there's 32,000 schools. Which school are you going to work in? Um, so we developed the teaching and learning policy. This is it here. You can find it all on my website if you want a copy and save yourself a bit of a headache. Uh, but blogging this, getting feedback from the profession, good and the bad, um, adding in all the resources that we were doing. We ended up building a, quite a big booklet as a CPD manual. But we had this one-page um, kind of policy on the front end, a one-minute summary. Uh, and all the key chapters of the both books, uh, or at least the first version, um, were the chapter titles. These were our CPD sessions, played with an idea, went off and practiced in the classroom, brought it back, reported to each other, repeat, repeat. Um, so between that period of 2014 to 17, I then thought, well, what the policy's written, I was fortunate enough to be already writing books. So I thought, well, why don't I construct it into a book? So that's what I did. And that book published uh, three years ago. Um, and I've shared it in 15 different countries, loads of interesting stories and experiences, um, you know, different languages, all sorts of things. So um, it's been a real privilege to go and see teachers work in different contexts. Um, and it's probably been the most fascinating aspect of my whole teaching career. Looking at all the analytics, Mark Plan teach at least teachers physically uh, that I work with, got all these cartoons behind the scenes. I never, I shared them once or twice on social media, but I didn't necessarily give them away. And there's a whole bank of video footage of me explaining this also. And I'm going to have an online course soon where I'm going to go through the whole of Mark Plan Teach 2 in kind of 20, 30 minute little videos as a CPD exercise for you. One and a half minute summaries, 20 minutes of paying attention, those types of things work best. And um, throughout lockdown, I've thankfully caught up with one or two online, six, uh, 60 countries, about 6,000 teachers. Thankfully, you know, self-employed, working on my own. Um, it's been a, a godsend for me and my mental health and a way to give back also. Um, and then finally, Mark Plantich, so published today, um, it kind of unpicks all the things that I've uh, kind of shared from that kind of seven, eight, and nine stage you can see uh, on the screen. So that's the journey. Um, Mark Plantich one. So I'm just going to go through all the kind of chapter headings here, and I'm going to just give you a little kind of camera walkthrough of the chapters of the book. Remember, the Mark section of the book is assessment. Assess plan teach isn't as a catchy title. I know teachers suffer with marking burden in all countries around the world. So mark plan teach. Marking and assessment underpins your curriculum plans. 
Um, so what I'm going to go through on this uh, particular resource is the, the notion of how can you work smarter, not harder, and what impact can it have? Um, if I just kind of maybe unpick one here that might not kind of make sense in terms of uh, uh, its terminology. Number eight is about looking in children's books. So without eight, never look in children's books without any context or focus. I know work scrutinies, particularly in some countries, can be a bit misleading, maybe a little bit dangerous and increase a lot of anxiety and workload for teachers. Uh, so number nine, a feedback loop. Let me introduce you to self-regulation. If you pick everything we do in the classroom, we want kids to behave better and to learn for themselves. So I set a goal, uh, draw a volcano, label the diagram. Uh, inside the students' processes, they have their domain knowledge, their cultural capital, the strategies that they can use, their motivation, Monday morning, Friday afternoon, etc. They then set their goal based on what Mr. McGill said. They select their tactics and then they set their own goal. Now, this all is internal. The challenge for me as a teacher is I don't see these, so I have to constantly unpick them. It's going to be an even bigger challenge doing this remotely. Physically, at least, we can observe non-verbal signals in the classroom. Um, so what we do is when we observe these signals, we then can use this data as a feedback loop to reteach in the moment or reteach or plan for the next lesson. But here's a little print. This is in Mark Plan Teach 1 and 2. And some of you will be familiar with Barrett Rosenstein's 17 Principles of Effective Instruction. I suspect not many of you of them of you can recall them all. So maybe seven is a better way to remember and probably a good approach for providing feedback. Here's what a good one looks like. Um, right, tell me this, hands up, hands down. Um, well done, Ross, have you thought about X? So I pose a question, get the discussion going. You've done really well today, make sure you do X. Have you thought about B? And then I then plug in the interventions in the lesson and outside of the lesson for next lesson. And then I use this data, this assessment feedback data, to plan where to go, either in that moment or for the next lesson. Seven principles of good feedback. I think this is a good win for everybody, regardless of where you teach. Um, Mark Plan Teach, so the planning section, thinking carefully about your planning coherence, asking why, not what. The next time you observe a teacher, ask them why they're teaching X rather than what are you teaching. Um, Storytelling, I'm going to give you a little example in a, sh uh, in a moment. Um, stickability, five-minute lesson plan, make learning stick, retrieval practice, memory, bringing content to life. Support versus challenge, you know, comfort versus panic. How do you get that thin line? There's a fantastic psychologist called Cheek Zen Mahai. I strongly recommend you have a look at in that chapter. Uh, I've got a great little snowball technique I picked up from another teacher in one of my schools. Uh, spelling test, throw the snowball around the classroom. Probably can't do that in COVID right now, but a great way to support literacy. Seven, you are the greatest resource in the classroom. And stockpiling loads of ideas, which is why we all love Twitter and social media for stockpiling resources. Um, behavior scripts, I'm a big fan of. And that well-being, you know, stripping back all the kind of nonsense and prioritizing well-being as a priority. Did you know the happier schools make teacher well-being part of their strategy rather than just that kind of sausage roll on a Friday afternoon to cheer staff up? So storytelling, one of the ideas in there, you know, you've got a five-stage sequence there. Here's a surprise. Uh, have a structure. So you think about the kind of classic children's story tales. They follow this kind of sequence. Um, you know, once upon a time, along came a dragon and until happy ever after, those types of methods. So use storytelling techniques to bring your complex curriculum to life in a pragmatic sense. So if it was, I was in a science lesson, I'd say, did you know that Jupiter has 79 moons? Or if I lived on Pluto, I would be half my body weight. Um, which might be a good thing for, for everyone who feels um, maybe a bit of lockdown weight. I certainly feel like that right now. Uh, there's the structure, the simplicity. Watch this little video to hook you in. We'll then draw the picture, explain the solar system, and then talk about the longer-term goal about understanding the solar system. Um, so tell stories uh, is what great teachers do all the time. Uh, the teach section, kind of moving on very swiftly, direct instruction, teacher at the front, explicit use of language, most effective teachers regularly model. Go with the flow. I'm going to explain memory in a moment. Observations, I've already mentioned. Um, two things, I guess, if you put me in a corner, teachers need to know about memory. Number five, they must master a wide range of questioning strategies 
in my opinion. Um, who meant German for Superman, so Superwoman? Uh, you know, what makes a great quality teacher? Uh, unpaid there. I've talked about the effective principles of instruction. I wrote about this in Mark Plan Teach. It's since done the rounds on social media. Some of you will be familiar with it. It's a great piece of research by Barrett Rosenshine. So I've just expanded on this a little bit in more detail in book two. Um, number eight is the thing that I learned in my uh, doctoral degree, Cambridge University. If you're a middle leader or a school leader watching this and you observe other teachers, go straight to this chapter. Um, getting kids to share in classroom, you know, in making classroom an inclusive place. And then that coaching one for people that want to unlock genuine teaching potential across the institution. So idea number four, memory. In a nutshell, um, you've got your short, long term and working memory. We have explicit content, so we know we're in this live session now. Uh, subconscious, so we know might, we've got to do certain things tomorrow. We have to make things implicit and explicit. Um, and it constantly waits between different pockets of short, working and long term. If we know that two plus two equals four, this knowledge um, is waiting to be of service. So this is what's called declarative knowledge. When I say two plus two and you say four, that you turn it into a procedure, an action, a goal-directed action. So what we've got over here is concept, rules, and facts. So the brain, space, two plus two, how to ride a bike, or two plus two, for example, or how tall is the Statue of Liberty? Well, we know it's X number of meters tall. There's a fact. Um, on the on number four here, we've got different types of, of kind of memory. Um, procedural knowledge turned into an action, so a bit like riding a bike. Do you do this consciously or subconsciously, a bit like autopilot? Priming, so a bit like uh, unconscious bias or layers. So I'm a DT teacher, I think of an undercoat. If I say doctor, what schema is illicit in your memory? Is it a white man with a stethoscope or is it a black female in a green lab jacket in the operating theater? Semantic and episodic memory. Episodic are your own memories where you're the star of the show. Um, birthdays, weddings, first job, those types of things. The danger with episodic memory, it fades and becomes unreliable over time, which is why photographs are very good for our memory. Semantic memory, concepts, rules, and facts. Well, we know, and if we practice and rehearse these concepts, rules, and facts, we can hopefully move them into long-term storage. So how we do this, curriculum approaches, I suppose. Kids' environment at home, remote teaching, our ability to pay attention, different cognitive load. Um, you know, we all have different buckets. We can cope with so much information. I'm conscious I'm squeezing through lots of things now. So we have a working memory. When I add lots of extra details, you're going to forget them. You can only store so much. So I have to be very conscious of what I share. In code, get information in. So a great curriculum approach. Think about how you're going to make things stick. Um, thinking about long-term memory is a shift in kind of knowledge. And then that retrieval. So teachers, we use revision. Cognitive scientists call it retrieval. It goes back 130 years. In fact, the first references to memory go back to 5 BC. So we're not the first people to talk about memory and retrieval practice. It's been going on for years. However, we need to understand it and know about it and share it with one another so we can become more effective and transfer knowledge from short-term information, short-term memory, to long-term retention. And that was my point I made earlier about uh, remote teaching and not always having to teach new material or send new material or resources to families at home. Um, so there's the book, everybody. I'm just going to come out of my slides and just go to the, the, the kind of visual book. I'm just going to skim through this. Um, so how the visual guide is looked at. These are one-minute cartoon summaries. So it's divided into mark plan teach, as you would expect. Um, this is kind of the kind of uh, editor copy, I suppose. But um, if I just switch my camera, let's see if I can just do this before Vikas um, stops me. I'm just going to turn my camera over. So you should be able to see my table now. So there's the book. So I would say start with that second. Start with the visual guide first. Um, so the visual guide... You know, if I just go back to, um, let's just go to one idea here, mind the gaps. So if I just zoom in on this one, for example, um, so you've got, you know, the one minute summary. Let me just get that in the right place. The one minute summary, this idea in particular, so this is idea number six in the mark section, talking about Evan House and the forgetting curve. You're going to forget everything that I've said, but hopefully you walk back, watch back this video, and then you can practice and remember um, what I've said. So closing the gap, there's 10 strategies there. So get your phones out, you pick this um, or grab the book. 
Uh, and there's some sample slides on the, the website also where you can get all these. So there's tons of stuff in here. Um, I won't have time to go through it all now. If I just flick through, um, and I know you can't see this now. Let me put my camera back up. There we go. Um, this is your best bet. So start here, find something that interests you, then go to the book, dig out the idea and the research. Uh, and I do think this will make a difference. So I'm really excited to take this back into schools. It's going to be a great resource for the staff room, a great manual to have in CPD sessions. Uh, and I can't wait to start getting my resources together to um, share some of this with you online as well as uh, when we get back into schools. So I'm going to stop there. There's lots of things. Um, and I hope, I hope you enjoy it. Ross, thank you so much for, uh, for, that, for that session. And I'm really excited that today for, for, for today's um, audience and participation, um, you know, we have someone that Ross and I both really truly admire who's here with us um, and he's made the time to join us. And that is um, uh, Professor Andy Hargreaves, who is Director of uh, the Change Management and Innovation in Education uh, Department at the University of Ottawa. And he's also a research professor in the Lynch School of Education and Human Development at Boston College and holds a visiting or honorary professorships at Hong Kong University, Swansea University, and the University of Stavanger in, uh, in Norway. He's also past president of the International Congress of School Effectiveness and Improvement, commissioning editor for the Journal of Professional Capital and Community, recent advisor in education to the Premier of Ontario and currently to the First Minister of Scotland, he is co-founder and president of the ARC Education Project, which is a group of nations committed to broadly defined excellence, equity, well-being, inclusion, democracy, and human rights in education. Uh, please welcome uh, our hero, uh, Andy Hargreaves. Andy, 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 Andy well, hi. Andy, well, well, welcome. Welcome, to, welcome to this live stream. Thank you so much for joining us. I know that in this segment, I'm excited for Ross to ask you questions. And normally it's the other way where, you know, it is Ross's book launch and we praise him. But in this case, we're making a, a huge departure and saying, well, Andy, thank you so much for joining us. And you are such an inspiration to all of us. Um, and I'm gonna leave Ross to ask you the questions. Well, welcome, uh, welcome everybody. And um, you know, if you don't like me, at least you can enjoy the view behind me. It's, uh, <laughs> it's about uh, minus twelve degrees today. Twelve in Ottawa. So if you think it's cold wherever else you are, uh, c come and join us here. As they say in Norway, there's no such thing as bad weather. There's only bad clothing. <laughs> so Andy, uh, thank you so much for joining me and uh, I want to start off by also saying um, you know, thank you so much for uh, writing the foreword of the book. I know you get inundated with lots of requests. Can I just ask you first of all to explain you know, what, you, what you took from the book and why you wanted to write the foreword uh, just for everyone watching? Uh, well, uh, first of all, I got the book from you. There wasn't much time to look at it, frankly, by the time the, uh, the, the, the manuscript arrived. And um, there's lots of things to do, and I felt a bit about it like I do about marking, which is, uh, oh, I'll put it off another day, I'll put it off another day. And then I, then I eventually I picked it up, and uh, I just couldn't put the thing down. I thought it was, uh, first of all, brilliantly counterintuitive. So uh, some people who know my work will know I wrote a book a few years ago called Uplifting Leadership. And in Uplifting Leadership, we studied unusually high performance in organizations in business, sports, and education where you'd least expect it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so people who didn't have much money, people who weren't very big, people who used to be failing, and then they'd turn themselves around. So we found with people like Burberry, Burberry took... Burberry took the old trench coat that used to be worn in World War I and rebranded it as something that young Asian women would buy online uh, very mm -hmm. successfully. Uh, we found that Cricket Australia actually increased its uh, impact by collaborating with its competitors, by actually investing in cricket development in India so that the competitions would be tighter, kind of more interesting, and, and everybody would get more engaged. And we looked at a school in Oldham where uh, that was uh, borderline failing, about to be closed down, predominantly Bangladeshi uh, British uh, students. And they focused on what the students were good at, which was which was particularly creative and visual arts. 
and uh, just suddenly propelled it into one of the most improved schools in the country. And this is what you do within your book. You, you take something everybody hates, and uh, if you were to write a book with marking in it, you'd probably put it last. You'd probably say, you know, plan, plan teach, mark is what you do. But, but, but you, I, I don't know how you thought about this or if you woke up in the middle of the night and, and decided, no, I'll, I'll put the wretched thing first, but, but you, you put it first. And, um, and, and so it really makes you think about marking from the beginning. Uh, mm. Not something dreadful like a standardized achievement test, like the Grim Reaper of yeah. uh, Ofsted, as you're inclined to call them. Of course, we're all, we're all entitled to hate that. Uh, but, yeah. uh, but, but of course, the dark sides of us also hate the marking as well. It yeah. is markings like death and taxes. It, no, it uh, is. Well, you know, my experiences are going around the world and drives everyone crazy. Um, I first came across your work from Professional Capital. We were lucky enough to meet uh, together in a, a conference in Switzerland a few it years was. ago. Um, I'd like, you know, with your wisdom, I, I wonder if you can just share some insights in a COVID context, you know, uh, that professional capital, how teachers have thrived through COVID, if that's possible, and what kind of research insights that, you, that kind of stand out for you. And where do you see things once we get back to some form of normality? Um, what impact will this pandemic have on the teaching profession? Well, uh, th thanks, Ross. I'd have been happy to talk a bit more about your book, actually, because it is just for everybody there. Uh, it is a, a, a lot, and I actually use it. I actually use it for my practice. I don't just use it, use it for my ideas as, as well. Um, so it's been really hard for everybody in the COVID almost all over the, the world. There have been some schools that have been countries where schools are out, some schools some places where they're in and some countries where it's like the hokey cokey it's it's in out shaking all about basically yeah. um, with England England's been a bit bit like that um, I I lead this group that, that I established of uh, seven uh, countries and systems and uh, their ministers and their teacher union leaders and we've been meeting regularly during covid just to share experiences and share strategies so scotland and wales and ireland yeah. are in there but but england's not for fairly predictable reasons probably and um as as we've been sharing these one thing up uh, uh, i'm also an advisor in scotland uh one of my advisors and we've just if you're interested go online um what we call the international council of educational advisors and we've just written a report on a post-pandemic uh, strategy for educational change. So in a second, if I can perhaps help you think about what's beyond the pandemic, not just what's here. And, and we approach it from really two places. One is the World Health Organization tells us it's not gonna be another 100 years until there's another pandemic. Uh, we, we had Ebola, we had SARS, we, we had HIV. I mean, they're all near misses in different ways, but because of, uh, of, of uh, climate change, um, in increasing likelihood of crises, contact of exotic species with human beings, the chances of pandemics like hurricanes and storms, uh, uh, they're going to be bigger and they're going to be more often. So we need a system um, that, that can actually be good in a pandemic mm -hmm. as well as good out of a pandemic. And so we talk in our report, what would that, how would you universally design that? to say at least it'll be okay in a pandemic uh, or any other crisis and it'll be brilliant outside it. And we, we say about three or four things. Uh, I'm not focus on all of them. Uh, one is, is we need to be more digital and more physical. So by being more digital, we need to know that we can survive and do okay. If kids have to be at home, we can be ready for it. Um, but also we need to think what the digital will look like in schools which when you're there with the kids, which means it doesn't replace teachers. Um, but, but every teacher needs to know now how to be competent and proficient uh, with digital as part of their practice. Uh, we don't like the anytime, anywhere hybrid blended talk because that mm -hmm. implies that technology is half of it and the entire rest of teaching is, is the other half, which is wrong, but rather technology should be like paint, glue, pens, uh, paper, uh, white, whiteboards, blackboards, it should just be there. It should be seamless. You use it when you need it. When you, when you don't want it, you, you don't use it ju just because it's there. So um, to have that, we need, I think, national platforms uh, like Estonia, 
which is one of the countries that responded best, mm -hmm. that are universal, public and free as a human right to all families, especially the poorest. Mm -hmm. So that's both devices uh, and, and broadband and access in any form uh, whatsoever. So we need to think about getting more digital. We need mm -hmm. the kids to have digital competence. So I think uh, the whole idea of developing self-directed learners, not hoping for it or presuming it, but actually from the age of five, De develop uh, four or five developing uh, self-directed learners and for teachers to be competent with that too. But we also know that to uh, take a country like Denmark, how has it responded to the pandemic? Well, even before the pandemic, it used digital for projects more than any other country in the world. 90% of teachers almost in Denmark say they use digital in some form or another. But during the pandemic, they use physical, natural, outside, uh, more than almost any other country. Physical digital is not a choice. It's a both mm -hmm. end, not, not an either or. And one thing we're learning is that uh, when you're worried about physical distancing and so on, uh, teaching outdoors actually is, is a good thing. We know we've already got lots of programs with outdoor education, but if you routinize that so that in the Nordic countries, uh, they have a recess outside every 50 minutes, even in the depths of, of winter, uh, teaching outside, learning outside, is, is part of our ancient communities, our indigenous communities. They do better when, when there's more uh, learning outside. It's part of environmentalism, of engaging yeah. with nature so that we can care about nature and care about the planet. And it's part of physical development and, and physical health as well. It integrates all these three things. So more digital, more physical, and just last of all, um, completely rethink, which relates to your book, the, the place and role of, of one time, end of school, life or death, 19th century examinations in a 21st century world for which there, there is no use or purpose anymore whatsoever. So, to, and the Scots have responded really well uh, to this report, including um, that. So, so watch Scotland over the next yeah, year. I was ask, you mentioned earlier uplifting leadership, and I know that you, um, some people may or may not know you work with the Scottish government in terms of the education. Um, yeah. Maybe a quick, uh, summary of your insights, the work that you've done, you know, we've seen Scotland respond in different ways here in the UK to a uh, pandemic, particularly from a school perspective, keeping schools open and closed that type of stuff. Any messages for maybe politicians watching in terms of the right type of leadership that's needed? Yeah, uh, well, well I, I think what we're learning, and uh, you know, this is not just the work we've done through ARC, but organizations like the OECD, uh, VCAS draws together a group of uh, former ministers that I've been glad uh, to be part of as well, to share experience. And I think, I, I think we learned that, that both in a school uh, and at the national level, and they're the same, really. What works mm -hmm. best is when people uh, work collaboratively. So they, they work in partnership. So yeah. that would include a community, a community's parents, a teachers, a professionals, governments, all actually around the table working in together. So there isn't a group somewhere that's dumping stuff on teachers to which they kind of then, which is happening in Ontario now where I am, which they then, and some of it might be good and some of it might not be good, but, but actually they, they have to work together. They look at the science, but the science is imperfect, mm -hmm. uh, it, right? It, it is, it's not totally uh, certain and it changes all the time. You get new variants, you get things transmitted uh, differently. So then you have to use the judgment. You have to use your judgment collectively in order to respond to the science and to balance it and to balance it against other things like you know jobs depression uh, th so i'd say basically uh, the, the good thing about the pandemic is almost everywhere people are saying teachers are collaborating even more than they were before even more uh, to finish you've got a new book as well tell everyone everyone, everyone about your memoir before we uh, uh, kind of end the, the whole session you've got a new book memoir and one on engagement Okay, so uh, half a paragraph on each. Uh, one is I grew up in Northern England uh, in a working class family, one of 
three brothers, the only one to go to university at the second attempt. My father died when I was uh, 12. Uh, my mother worked three jobs and it was too much for her. Then she collapsed and then basically I ended up having to look after her and the family rather than, rather than her looking after me. The reason I'm in teaching is a magnificently inspiring uh, primary teacher um, who, who taught me before my dad died. And my secondary school teachers were awful. Uh, almost every last one of them could not connect with me as a whole person. I lived on one side of town, went to school on the other, could not connect the cultures. This wasn't race, um, but it was class. And um, by the way, we need to talk about class as well as as well as race and the cultures that divide people. So the book is really um, about my own narrative of what it felt like to live on one side of town and go to school on the other, to have one set of experiences in my community and confront a curriculum that have very little uh, a connection to them. And how it's like that for lots of kids now who are not just different by class, but different by race, different by language, different by different by sexuality, different by coming from another country, and so on. And the book takes you through that in a fairly compelling, gritty way. So some of it is moving. Uh, some of it is occasionally funny. Um, and at the end, it, it really talks about strategically what does this mean for social mobility. And in a mm. short sentence, social mobility is not an alternative to equity. So social mobility is what chance we have in equity, but what chances do I have to move up? So conservatives like social mobility, mm -hmm. but rather social mobility is a consequence of equity. The more equity you have, the smaller the gaps are, the more people travel up together mm -hmm. and the closer the rungs are together. So mobility Improve. So if you want mobility, you need more equity. And the book talks about very clear, specific strategies like abolish internships, for example, because uh -huh. they suit the public. Uh, the book, engagement. Uh, the book of engagement is coming out in June. Ross is in it. And uh, it, it talks about, uh, it builds on research we've done, uh, with uh, particularly with rural and isolated schools. And... Um, a lot of people worry about engagement. There's there's a million books on it, workshops, professional development. Engagement's not improving. Kids are just engaged, just as disengaged as they always were. So people who think engagement is a problem of teachers just not not getting smarter, sharpening up, getting their act together, and knowing how to enthuse the kids a bit more. That is not the issue. The mm -hmm. issue is there are what we call five enemies of engagement, and the enemies of engagement are systemic. They are things like bureaucratic testing. Um, they are an alienating curriculum that takes the magic and, and, and the wonder out of uh, teaching by standardizing it. They're, it's disempowerment by giving kids uh, no voice. It's distraction by getting kids involved in superficial technology rather than deep engagement with, with and without technology. So the five enemies are, if I can remember them, one word each, they are, and you'll read them in the book, uh, they are disenchantment, loss of loss of magic, disempowerment, loss of loss of power, um, disassociation, uh, sorry, disconnection, which is alienation from the curriculum, disassociation, which is lack of belonging, and the distraction, particularly by technology. If we want to increase engagement, We've got to attack those five systemic things in a school and, and in a country, as well as just expecting teachers to put their act together better in their own classes. Andy, uh, thank you so much for your participation. And, you know, there's a few comments that have come in which I want to flash up, which I think you'll also welcome. But before I do yours, I want to show Asia, Asia Kazmi, who is a friend of mine, used to be a teacher, now works at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, says, Ross, I really like the simplicity of your title. But then thank we... You. Andy, we go to Douglas Sinclair, says need to challenge inequitable structures that cause disadvantage instead of just supporting young people to be more resilient to cope. Um, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a user, I don't know the name. I'm completing my master's and quoted professional capital in my last assignment. Great to put a face to the name, Professor Hargreaves. Good luck uh, with that. 
And then we have Naomi, Naomi Tolan, from, teacher from Derry living in Japan and loving the conversation. We need a system that is good in a pandemic and out. We need to be physical and digital, I think you said, Andy. Yep. Um, we got Patricia Messenger Duncan, who talks about kids don't know how to use computers well. They're too yep. used to phones and tablets. These needs to be really dealt with to reduce future yep. issues. Uh, Matthew obviously states the obvious. So much sense being spoken here. Uh, someone says we need to address the digital poverty here yep. in the UK. Yep. Um, you know, and on and on it goes. Jennifer says it really well. So inspiring. My brain is buzzing with all these ideas. Really insightful and useful. Has given me a lift and ready to be creative and out ideas into action and practice. And it just goes on and on, Andy. So, you know, I, I, someone's asked for your link, which, which you can find if you Google Professor Andy Hargreaves, you'll find it, I bet you. Yeah. So, if, uh, if you want the link, it's just two places, worldwideweb.andyhargreaves.com and uh, at Hargreaves BC on uh, Twitter. I don't have as many followers as, as Ross, uh, but, but I have a few. And so, Andy, there's one final question for you. What's the name of your book on engagement? Uh, we're still arguing it with a publisher, but we think it's, because it's with them now, it's in press. We think it's uh, the five paths of engagement, um, colon, blazing the trail to learning and success. Are you an academic? <laughs> yeah, does that sound like does that sound like an academic title? That's the one they wanted. It's not the what would you call it? Engagement. How about that? Well, well I just thought it to call it student engagement, and, and and they don't like that. But I'll tell them. Tell them. Tell them to watch this. Ross has said so. Tell them. Okay. For so the what? five engagement things, or um, that'll sell it. That'll sell. The five so, the five things you think? Yeah. Five so, engagement. Okay. But no, I agree with you actually. I, I'm well, gonna put, I'm gonna type that I, I'm gonna I'm gonna print that that you agree with me and I'm gonna put it up. Oh, the most I, I, you you sent me your suggestion. Yeah, I've got some authority for it. Okay. Great. Uh, Andy, uh, uh, you know, there's this uh, obviously we, we say once again, please buy this book. Yeah. Mark and teach. Uh, you know, there's a discount being provided by Bloomsbury which you can go to, and, and it, I think it's 25% off, if I'm not mistaken. So please go to this. We still have a lot of watches on this. Uh, I have one final appeal for you before I hand it back to Ross for a goodbye. Um, you know, today you're watching this on the T4 platform. Yeah. Uh, you know, T4 was born uh, during the pandemic. It was an expression um, you know, and a desire that actually we had, a group of friends of us had, to go and help teachers during this time. And we hosted a couple of virtual events like this. One of them was to, to help teachers figure out what the new normal may be for them. Yeah. This was last May. And we had this astounding response in like three and a half weeks, you know, 103,000 teachers from around the world registered and participated. And then later on, we went to do something called World Education Week, which is exactly what Andy was speaking about, which was focused on collaboration mm -hmm. and learning from different contexts. There's no reason, because COVID has brought us all to our knees to a degree, yeah. that we can't learn what other people are doing in other contexts yeah. and apply them in our setting, wherever they are in the world. And for the first time, Andy, I found that you know there was a receptivity to learning lessons from uh, middle-income countries and low-income yeah. countries as much yeah. as us going the other way. It yeah. was all happening the other way, which yeah. I thought was very powerful. And so that's how T4 was born. Now, carrying on the theme... Uh, one of the things that we're doing is hosting hosting the um, the Teacher Technology Summit, which is in April, on the 17th of April. It's a three-hour virtual conference. And if you're a teacher that wants to know about things like how to, how to design the learning experience for hybrid environments or creating community in online classrooms or how to create good digital content, how to assess learning in online yeah. environments, you know, ensuring equity and inclusion in online learning. I'd, I'd like to please request that you go and register at t4.education uh, for that event. It's a three-hour event in the afternoon UK time uh, for people to go and, and register. And so I thank you all for participating uh, in today's event. Uh, and I thank all of our speakers. Um, so there's Andrea Zafiriku, who won the Global Teacher Prize, Vijita Patel, who is the principal of the Swiss Cottage School, and obviously, Professor Andy Hargreaves, who we have such admiration for, for everything that he does. Ross, um, it goes without saying, I'm going to give you the final word tonight. But congratulations. Uh, and, you know, we wish you all success 
in, in everything that you do. I, I read Andy's forward uh, in your book just yesterday, and he said it right. He said, yeah. you are the teacher's teacher. Uh, yeah. And uh, thank you so much for that, Ross. You yeah. do a great service to the world. I'll end by the quote that I provided for, for the back jacket of your book, which says, what Ross has written is so accessible and yet so provoking giving teachers hints, tips, and practical ideas on how they can improve their practice and ultimately raise learning outcomes for their pupils is what matters. And by focusing on this, Ross does the entire country a youth service. I should actually say Ross does the entire world yeah. a youth service, given that there's so many people from around the world watching this. Friends, I thank you all. And now I hand over to Ross for his concluding remarks. Uh, well, I, you know, I'm just delighted everyone's joined and uh, uh, sharing an interest. Um, you know, thank you again, Vikas, for hosting it, and Andrew to Vegeta for taking part, and for Andy also taking some time out of your busy schedule to join me. Um, you know, I hope we get to meet very soon again uh, on our travels. Uh, yeah. I'm just going to say one thing, everybody. If you go to teachertalkit.co.uk forward slash thank you with a hyphen between thank and you, You'll get all the speaker profiles that have taken part tonight, all the resources, some videos, uh, some links to kind of little snippets from the book, and all the links to all the books uh, with the Bloomsbury discount. As, and they all, you also get a notepad, as well as just, you know, if you want to get it straight on Amazon. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. It, it's late for us here in the UK. It's probably the first thing in the morning for you, Andy. Um, so well, Andy's got work yet. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. I hope the book makes a difference. Uh, thank you, Andy. Thank you so much, everyone, and good night. Uh, I'll, I'll check on Twitter now for uh, and Instagram and Facebook for all your comments, and I'll choose some winners, and I'll get those posted to you this weekend. Good night, everyone. Cheers, Vikas.